Hi everyone. I'll try to keep this quick so it won't spend a long day. Uh, so I'll be talking uh, about sample variants. Uh, this background image here I uh, constructed. I used the, uh, the GSM um, model, and on top of that, I stacked a, a kind of amplified EOR signal with the tile to the full sky. So sort of a preview of where this work should eventually be going is to doing full sky simulations of an EOR model. Uh, unfortunately, it's not quite there yet, but that's uh, not coming. Uh, so, uh, as has been said, low-frequency 21 centimeter experiments are trying to measure the uh, power spectrum from neutral hydrogen during the cosmic dawn. And uh, we're uh, considering if, if all of these foreground and systematic effects have been dealt with, we still have a fundamental uncertainty in the quantity that we're measuring because it is a statistical measurement. And as we use these highly redundant arrays uh, to measure them, those redundant groups of baselines are all measuring the same angular Fourier mode, uh, which means that we're getting fewer samples, fewer independent samples of the power spectrum uh, for a given uh, instrument. So when we eventually want to use these power spectrum measurements for fitting uh, uh, EOR models and for precision cosmology, this uncertainty can become a uh, significant factor. So I've uh, respectfully stolen uh, figure 10 from Jonathan Pover's paper, which shows uh, from his code of 21 cm cents that the fiducial EOR model uh, on the larger angular scale, the lower K modes, uh, the, the sample variance can dominate the thermal noise uh, for a moderate uh, foreground removal strategy. And this is with a fairly large uh, array, it's not going to be built. So for this talk, I'll start by discussing the uh, simulation code that I've written to uh, explore this question uh, and the flat spectrum uh, full sky EOR model that I'm feeding into it. I'll talk a little bit about uh, delay spectrum estimation, which Matt's already covered, but uh, show how that leads into uh, understanding how visibilities, uh, or how the visibilities correspond with each other in time uh, and how that relates to independence of separate samples of the sky over time. And then most of the results are measure, actually measuring the sample variance uh, from simulations with para and MWA with Gaussian beans. And uh, so uh, my simulator is called Fieldhiz. Um, I wrote it because we don't have enough uh, visibility simulators. So, <laughs> so. Uh, well, mainly I wrote it because um, high UV sim is kind of the standard that we're working toward, but it doesn't do diffuse models yet, and I needed something fast that could do it. So it works by uh, doing a brute force evaluation of the visibility equation, taking a uh, temperature, a, a prime, usually a primary analytic beam model, and a fringe term, and uh, just adding them up as uh, treating the, the pixels of the sky as point sources at the pixel centers which for the fringe widths and, uh, and resolutions I'm simulating is, is a decent approximation. And uh, so I have over here a, an image of the, uh, with, uh, that I took of the, the GSM using the phase, uh, MWA phase one core uh, with the simulator. Uh, so you can find this on uh, GitHub. It's posted by the Radio Astronomy Software Group, but it really is, um, not really designed for, for public use. So be careful. Uh, so it has proven to be a, a significant challenge to actually generate a full sky model with a, an EOR-like signal. Uh, it's easy enough. You can run a, a, a semi-analytic simulation in a rectangular box and evolve that over time, something like 20 OCM sense. But to actually fit, extrapolate that to a full sky is challenging. So uh, for this study, all I needed was a, a sky model with a known physical power spectrum. So I have a set of uh, field fixed maps at a bunch of different frequencies, which correspond with different co-moving distances. And uh, for each voxel on this uh, on this model, I 
filled with um, Gaussian random noise with a variance that scales as a ratio of the box to the volume. And the result of that is that the full sky model should have a flat power spectrum with an amplitude given by the uh, variance, the variance at that uh, reference frequency and the box to volume at that reference frequency. So the, the delay transform was introduced uh, Parsons 2012. It allows you to get an estimate of the power spectrum without doing any kind of uh, sky reconstruction or imaging. Essentially, you have visibilities which are already in uh, a angular Fourier basis. So you just do a Fourier transform along the frequency axis, and that gives you something proportional to uh, the full Fourier term. So there's your play transform, and then you can cross multiply and average these across the uh, redundant base, uh, baseline, and it's scaled by some cosmological scaling factors, the, the bandwidth, and the integral of the primary beam. Uh, here I've used an estimator where I'm just averaging for a single baseline, averaging these uh, uh, estimates in time, and I've uh, let the phi substitute for both of the terms. And it turns out that for uh, mean zero Gaussian variables, so if the sky is uh, Gaussian like I have, then the variance just ends up being the uh, sum of the squares of all the uh, all the terms of the covariance matrix. Uh, so to understand the sample variance, we need to look at the covariance of visibilities over time. Uh, so that, I ran a series of simulations uh, and directly measure the covariance by averaging over an ensemble of sky realizations. So uh, this is something we can't do with data because we only have one sky to work with. Essentially, so uh, uh, the covariance matrix by uh, by the isotropy of the sky, it should be uh, uh, symmetric in time. So it does show this uh, bright band in the middle of and it drops off as we go, as the, as, as the observations get farther and farther apart. Uh, so we can bin that in the time difference and get this uh, nicely peak, uh, pretty close to a Gaussian shape uh, in covariance function. Now, if I measure the full width of half max of that function, I get uh, what I'm calling the correlation time or the correlation length. And uh, it shows some interesting behavior as you vary the beam width and the, the baseline length and the uh, baseline angle. So the left plot, I have a, only east-west baselines, and the color is uh, the baseline length that I'm looking at. The x-axis is showing the Gaussian beam width in degrees, and the uh, correlation time is the full width half max of that uh, Gaussian T. And we see there are two clear regimes where, in one case, increasing the beam width decreases your correlation length, which will translate to a lower sample variance uh, or faster drop off in the sample variance over time. And in the other regime, uh, increasing your beam width actually increases your correlation length. Uh, we also see with the uh, baseline angle, so this is for a 25 meter baseline, uh, and the angle is the angle above east. Uh, the higher the angle, the longer the correlation length. But it doesn't seem to have any impact on this turnover. The turnover peak seems to depend mostly on the uh, baseline length. So this was kind of puzzling at first. We'd normally expect there to be one behavior or the other. You think with a wider beam, you're selecting a wider field of view. So as you rotate the sky, or as you think of the Earth rotating, uh, there's more overlap. Uh, but you can also think of it in terms of uh, Fourier space, where you're for a fixed space center, your uh, beams are are moving, or your beam is moving through Fourier space, and uh, the wider beams have a narrower footprint, so there's less overlap there. It turns out both of these are kind of true in different cases. Uh, so there is an expression for you can derive an expression for the correlation, uh, which which is generally applies for most uh, some basic assumptions about the power spectrum. It depends on the product of your uh, primary beam at one time with the 
primary beam rotated on the sky, so R is the rotation between the two times. And then there's a fringe term, which has the uh, baseline projected onto the different vector from that rotation. So for a very small baseline, effectively this fringe term comes out, and it just depends on the overlap between the primary beams in uh, sky coordinates. But for uh, large B, uh, for large baselines, then this, uh, this term dominates, and you end up with something, it becomes sort of a Fourier transform, and you're convolving in UV space. And so this more or less explains the uh, change in behavior. So I've made some plots showing uh, the integrands uh, of, of the, the terms inside that integral for uh, narrow beams on the top row, uh, wide beams on the bottom row, and uh, a short baseline and a uh, long baseline. And you can see the, the, the uh, correlation is this, the integral over this whole square over time. And the, we're varying the, uh, the angle between the uh, uh, two observations. Uh, so the, the short baseline with the wide beam has this long time where there's significant power here. Uh, but the, it will, the, the fringe will average over hours out faster um, uh, over, over the same time frame. Just to move along really quickly. So, some, uh, so going with this, I'm using this sort of to explain why uh, we see this behavior that we do with sample variants. I uh, simulated uh, six, ante or six antennas uh, with three long baselines and three short baselines, and then measure the, uh, the sample variance. Uh, we see that for the short baseline, uh, I did this with two different beams. So the solid line is for an MWA-like beam, uh, which uh, 31 degrees, and the dash is for a Harrow-like beam, which is a bit narrower. For the short baseline, we see the MWA beam is on top, and uh, the Harrow beam is, on, is underneath, so it's the Harrow beam is dropping off faster. But we see mostly the opposite behavior for the long baselines. So it's due to this turnover in the uh, in the correlation length. Uh, I also simulated a 37 element hex, uh, hexagon array, and we see there's a general trend with increasing baseline length it drops off the, the sample variance faster, but it's a little more compact for the narrower Hera beam uh, because those correlation lengths are close together. Uh, there's a little scatter in those curves due to the baseline angle. So here I showed me at 24 hours of averaging the uh, uh, baseline length and then the color to give the angle. Um, so I see I'm out of time. Um, so we can actually really improve on this estimate by binning in K. Uh, so these curves aren't very promising. You know, we're seeing sample variance upwards of 20 or 15 percent. But by choosing uh, some uh, K-bin scale, uh, we can actually bring it down under 3.5% for, for all of our K-modes. Uh, so this is at uh, 8 hours of LST or 24 hours of LST, so sort of an, a pessimistic and optimistic case of what was available. And the, uh, the results of binning for the 37 element hex in these logarithmic uh, bins. So, uh, just put up some conclusions. Uh, I think these are some promising results. It's saying a sample variance is not going to be an issue for detecting the EUR, but it's something we'll have to take into consideration when looking to actually use this data to constrain our cosmological models. And uh, this has been recently published in uh, MinRAS, so you can find the paper on the archive. Uh, so for 
I have another plot which is not included here, uh, showing what happens if you set a maximum baseline length. Uh, you can, even just including the next longest baseline from the shortest, drop it drastically. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to use all of the baselines in the array, but I think using the three shortest baselines gives you uh, so using just the three 14 meter baselines in Hera, for instance, would give you this line, which comes down to 10% at 24 hours of averaging, which is maybe not as much you want. 